That seems to me to be an idea of fundamental importance, which still isn't universally understood, that we are not confronted with the choice between being either materialists on the one hand and believing in some, as it were, spiritual or abstract realm on the other. There is a third way of explanation of our experience, and it is, as you're suggesting, a way that Aristotle pioneered. Yes. Now, there's something we haven't touched on in this discussion at all, but I think we must say something about it, and that is Aristotle's writing on ethics. Mm. I don't think it would be any exaggeration to say that he's the most influential moral philosopher that there's ever been. Now, can you tell us something about where his gigantic influence in this field springs from? I think his influence, to me, springs first of all from the question that he begins with. Some, many moral philosophers begin by making a sharp distinction between the sphere of the moral and the, all the rest of human life. And they begin ethics with the question, what is my duty or what is my moral duty? Now, Aristotle begins instead with a much more general question. That is, what is it to lead a good human life? And this allows him to investigate the areas that we would associate with the, the moral alongside and in their relation to other areas of human life, such as intellectual commitment, personal love and friendship, and to ask subtle questions about their interrelationships and what it would be to construct a good life out of all these elements. So he has a very rich sense of what morality consists in. That's a contrast with some other very famous moral philosophers, isn't it? For example, the utilitarians thought that the single measure of all moral behavior was happiness happiness or pain, and that you could, you could chart the, the desirability or non-desirability of all moral action on one single measuring rod, which was named happiness. Now, mm -hmm. Aristotle was very alive to the fact that you couldn't do that, wasn't he? Yes, you've mentioned uh, the image of the measuring rod. That's a very important one for Aristotle. Now, in fact, it's not only that he refuses to reduce the many things of value to one single measure, but he also wants to say that even in each area, you can't approach a complex context with a, a straight edge, so to speak. He gives this image, and he says that just as an architect is not going to try to measure a complex fluted column with a straight ruler, so too the ethical judge is not going to take a simple and inflexible set of rules into the complexities of a practical situation. Instead, just as the architect measures with a flexible strip of metal, which, as he puts it, bends to the shape of the stone and is not fixed, even so, you or I, coming into a complex ethical situation, have to have our faculties, as it were, open and responsive, ready to shape ourselves to the complex, perhaps non-repeatable demands of this particular situation. And as he says, the discrimination rests with perception, which is going to be prior to any rules at all. And another thing that impresses me very much about Aristotle's moral philosophy is his firm grasp of the fact that we don't, as it were, control our own moral environment, that we can't be, as the later Stoics uh, wanted us to be, entirely self-contained moral entities, and we can't be, as perhaps the Epicureans later wanted, we can't be detached moral entities. We live in a moral environment which buffets us about and that we can't entirely master. He seems to have understood that. Yes, I think he's understood it better than almost any philosopher who's written in this area, that the good life for a human being if it's to be rich enough to include everything that's of value, say, for example, personal love and friendship, has got to be vulnerable to many factors that we don't altogether control, and that any attempt to close off those areas of vulnerability is going to result in an impoverishment of our life. And do you think he had anything like the notion of moral luck, which philosophers yeah. have written about in recent years? Yes, I think he does. That is, he uh, certainly does ask the question, which features of the good life are not under our control, and how can our, not only our ability to act virtuously, but actually our virtuous character itself be shaped and altered by factors that we don't control? Now, I think myself, he doesn't go quite far enough here because he's so interested in describing a good life that's harmonious and balanced. That is, his image is always of a life where there are many components that's very rich in different sorts of value, but where everything is engineered and balanced together in harmony. And I think this prevents him from doing justice to the way that certain constituents of a life, if properly pursued in all their depth, actually can have it in them to challenge and call into question all the others that, uh, say, take the way that 
deep love can sometimes threaten and oppose virtue. I think this is something that Aristotle is very silent on. It's an area of moral luck, which I would regard as very important, that he, he actually says nothing about. In fact, he has almost nothing at all to say about erotic love. Uh, I think because he's so interested in having something that's harmonious and balanced. Now, up to this point in our discussion, we've been so concerned to get across some of the really important ideas that he put forward that we haven't stopped to critically evaluate them. But you've now put your finger on one aspect of his thought, which is, in your view, a shortcoming. Uh, what, what are one or two of the other major respects in which you think Aristotle's open to criticism? Well, I think one of the major areas is his political theory. Now, I think there are a lot of good things here, and among the good things is uh, an account of politics or the role of government as providing all the necessary conditions to each citizen for the living of a rich and good human life, an account of the good as based on a variety of different functionings that actually go to constitute a good human life. But the problem comes with his account of who it is who's to be a citizen. And here he has a, a very narrow-minded attitude towards the foreigner towards women. But isn't it being unfairly anachronistic uh, to condemn Aristotle from our position now in the 20th century for having been, for having undervalued women or undervalued the lower orders or undervalued foreigners? Because after all, didn't more or less everybody at that time think in that way? No, I don't think so. Certainly on the issue of slavery, he's opposed to some more radical positions that would say that all slavery is unjust. He knows those positions. He argues against them. And in the case of women, well, I mean, first of all, in just in his biology of women, he rejects theories that are vastly more informed and more correct than his about the contribution of women to reproduction. You know, he thinks that a woman doesn't actually contribute any formal characteristics to the offspring. Well, even well, democracy is just a sort of conduit for, that, the, for, right. the, for, for, for the offspring. And in politics, of mm. course, Plato yeah. was able to take a position of detachment towards women that did come to the conclusion that we better educate each individual person in the state according to that person's personal capabilities. And uh, that meant to Plato that women ought to be given the chance to be assessed as individuals and to be educated accordingly. Thank you very much, Martha Nostal. Thank you, Brian.